Hey everybody, um, today we're going to go ahead and look at uh, solutions and solution formation and something called solubility. Uh, you should have some general ideas about what solutions are, but uh, basically in this video lesson I'm just going to give you an idea of the differences between um, ionic compounds and, and uh, molecular compounds and we're going to look at how and why solutions form and give you a, a way to make that prediction. You can make a prediction on whether something will dissolve in a solvent based on, on the, the, the structure of the, the solute we're talking about. Okay, so you should know that there's two parts to a solution. The solute, which is what I'm going to use in here is salt, and my solvent, which is the water. Now the solvent is almost always the, the more, uh, the one that's in a larger amount, okay? Uh, but we're going to see that the act of dissolving is actually a mutual thing between the solvent and the solute. We think of the solvent as being the uh, the doer of the dissolving, but really it's something that both of the solute and the solvent have in common. Now you should be familiar with you know the fact that table salt, which is what I have here, is, which is sodium chloride, NaCl. And if I take here, I'm going to do is I'm going to test something, which is called the conductivity tester. You saw me use this in, in first semester where um, I put a light bulb into the water and we could see if a light bulb lights up. Well this is tap water so we can see the lights up just a little bit. You can see a little bit of light coming off of this uh, light bulb. Uh, so what we can do is add some salt to this. So if I shake some salt into the water we can see the concentration of the salt is going up. Okay and then we can actually come over here and test the conductivity again by plugging this in. We can see that the light bulb is now lighting up with a lot more um, energy. We get more a brighter light bulb. And you remember I did this first semester, the light bulb lit up really, really bright. So if I keep adding salt, what look what happens to the light. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter as my concentration goes up. This is referred to as an electrolyte. So we find is that we put ionic compounds into water and they dissolve, um, they're going to produce what's called an electrolyte. The solution is now considered an electrolyte. It allows an electrical energy to pass through. Because the connections here, they're not connected together so the light bulb doesn't light up. When I put them in, the ions that are in the solution allow that to happen. Okay. Uh, now let's see what happens if I remove the salt, or if I reset everything and I change this to sugar. Now you should know that sugar dissolves in water, so we'll go ahead and add some sugar to this. But something different happens when we put sugar in here. Okay, so if I put sugar, let's just go ahead and put a lot of sugar in here. Let the concentration of sugar get really high. Or maybe not, but okay, so there's one way we can make it go higher is I can take out some of the water. So let's evaporate some of the water. You can see the concentration. Well, I guess it's not going to go up. It should, but anyway, well, I guess I'm out of sugar. No more is coming out. Point is, put this in here, no conductivity because the sugar is considered a non electrolyte. The sugar is not giving us the ability to conduct an electric current. Okay, so let's see why. What's going on at the microscopic level with this? So let's go ahead and reset everything. All right, so let's go ahead and put some sodium chloride in here. Remember, NaCl. When I put the NaCl in, what happens is these ions break up. So the little purple ones are the, uh, or pink, depending on your uh, eye color here, what if you can determine the color there, uh, are the sodium ions, and the larger green ones are the chloride ions. And notice that they're moving around and they're separating from each other. This is what allows the conduction of electric current, the fact that the ions break up. This is called dissociation. And when they break up into pieces and dissociate, these ions then allow the conduction of electric current. So let's go ahead and get that out of there. Let's go ahead and actually use some sugar. Because if I put the sugar in here, watch what happens to the sugar molecules. The sugar molecules separate and spread out, but they are not dissociating and breaking apart. They're actually staying together in their sugar molecules. So what's happening is the water is surrounding and separating out the sugar molecule, but not the atoms in there. There's no ions in here, so therefore no conduction of electric current. We can actually go even deeper and look at this even even you know a little bit more closely by looking at the water molecules really really close up. So you got the oxygen is the red, hydrogen is the white ones. Okay, now watch what happens when I put sodium chloride into the water. Again, ions break up and they dissociate. Now the question is, why is this happening? What's going on that causes this to happen? Well, water has polarity to it. If you remember back in chapter, I honestly don't remember what the chapter was, but it was on bonding or chapter on bonding. We talked about the fact that there's intermolecular forces between uh, the substances. That actually wasn't in the bonding chapter. It was our chapter. Uh, no, it was on bonding. I'm sorry. It was at the very end. We talked about the different types of intermolecular forces. Remember, water being polar has a negative side to the water molecule. So notice what happens here is 
a lot of the oxygens are lining up and are being attracted to that sodium ion. This is called hydration when the water surrounds that ion. Now hopefully we can get a chloride ion in here again. Let's try that again. Let's um, there's a reset over here. Let's go ahead and put the sodium chloride back in. And notice what happens here is that the hydrogen ions are attracting to, notice the white ones are all kind of attracting to the chloride ions. Again, attraction to the chloride. So we're getting the separation of ions by the fact that water is polarized and so is the sodium ion. It has a positive charge that's attracted to the water and so is the chloride. All right, so let's see what happens when we put the sugar into the water. We put sugar in the water. Again, we get the separation of the molecules, but notice they didn't break up. Okay, I'm going to show you in better detail. It's a little hard to see here what's going on because you can't really see the, the structure of this. But again, a separation of the sugar molecules is happening. The water is surrounding the whole sugar molecule and separating it out. Okay, so that should give you some idea at least as, as to what's going on at the solution level. Let me show you one more thing here, actually. Um, let's take a look at what happens if I put calcium chloride in water. Here's the formula for calcium chloride, CaCl2. When I put that in here, Watch what happens to the, con the concentration of the ions. I get twice as many ions in solution than I do the chloride ions. Okay, I'm sorry, the calcium ions. So I get twice as many chloride ions as I do calcium ions because in the compound I have twice as many here. So therefore I'm going to have a higher concentration of chl um, chlorine ions than I will calcium ions. This is really important because when we think of ionic compounds dissolved in water, we don't think of them as a group. We think of them as the separate ions, and I'm going to talk about this in just a second, show you some, some calculations. We think of them as just separate ions. So let me go ahead and clear this out and put in another one. Let's say that I put in here, um, oh, I guess I don't have any other ones. I guess it was the only one. Uh, if I put in sodium nitrate. If I put in sodium nitrate, what do you think this is going to break up into? Okay, hopefully you remember that there's a polytomic ion known as nitrate. So if I shake those ions into the solution, what I'm going to get is the nitrates break up and the sodium ions. And it's going to be an even ratio because I have one sodium to one nitrate, just like I would for sodium and chlorine. Okay, so if I pause this, you can see that the nitrates stay together because they're molecular. They're nitrogen and oxygens. Okay, so let's go ahead and summarize what we just saw here in the video uh, and um, kind of make some sense out of this. Okay, so what we saw was the dissolving of ionic compounds. What happens with the ionic compounds is that the positive uh, sodium ion is attracted to the negative part of the polar water molecule. This is what makes water a uh, called the universal solvent because it's very strongly polarized, has that hydrogen bonding between water molecules that is strongly attracted to the positive and the negative ions. So it's because the water molecule comes in here and pulls out that ion that it surrounds it and all of those oxygens are attracted to the positive. All of the hydrogens are attracted to the anion, so our sodium ion. So those ions get completely separated and dissolve into the water. With sucrose, or I'm sorry, in this case, glucose, sorry, doesn't matter. It's a sugar. All sugars are going to do this, whether it's sucrose, fructose, glucose, doesn't matter. What we have on here are OH groups, just like the water. It looks a lot like the water molecule is at oxygen, hydrogen. Well, there's going to be hydrogen binding that this is going to create between the water and the glucose. And notice that there's a number of these OH groups on here which creates a lot of attraction to the water molecule. Notice that in here what I have is this uh, bonding here that's going on is between the positive hydrogens and the negative oxygens. Between the negative oxygen and the positive hydrogen. So we get this attraction going on and this is going to cause this substance to dissolve into water, these attraction forces. So these hydrogen bonds that are coming in surround the sugar, in this case glucose, and pull it into solution and make it dissolve. So for ionic compounds, what we find is that ionic compounds are extremely polar. Water has that hydrogen bonding, which is extremely polar. Okay, so because they're both polar is going to be the key here. They both have an affinity for each other, an attraction for each other. Now, water is known as a universal solvent because of its extreme polarity. The, due, the, the fact that it has such a high polarity due to that hydrogen bonding that it can create allows water to dissolve quite a bit of substances. It's obviously not going to dissolve everything, uh, but it is known as the universal solvent. And as we saw in the video, when we dissolve ionic compounds into water, they always create strong electrolytes. They're going to always produce large amounts of, of well, I should say that back, they conduct a large amount of electrical energy. They don't produce it, but they just conduct it. Now, if we look at 
um, ionic compounds, what we can do is we can write these formulas out. So if I take sodium chloride and I dissolve it, we think of the sodium as ions, not as you know, a formula unit. So when we see sodium AQ, we right away think of it as ions in solution separated from each other. Calcium fluoride, we have them broken up into twice as many fluoride ions. When we talk about uh, uh, concentrations of solutions in the next video, it's going to be very important because we don't think about the concentration of this, we think about the concentration of the ions that are in solution. And as I said before, dissociation or to dissociate means to break up into ions. So if you hear that word, if you see me talking about dissociation or to dissociate, that means that it breaks up into the ions that we have. So, so ionic compounds, when they dissolve, will also dissociate and that's what causes the, the conduction of electric current. The number of ions in solution depends on the ionic compound that we have of course. Now you know not everything dissolves in water and you should be familiar that oil doesn't dissolve in water. And The reason why oil won't dissolve in water has to do with its chemical structure. It's made up of all these hydrocarbons that have hydrogens all on the outsides okay, and they keep repeating themselves over and over and over again and essentially what we find is that that, that, that oil or, or nonpolar oil, I should say, is that it's, it's not going to have any attraction to the water molecule because this essentially is evenly distributed throughout and we find that this is nonpolar. So we have a nonpolar molecule here. Whereas glucose that I showed you before, that glucose was actually had some polar regions on it and allowed it to dissolve. Here there isn't, that isn't the case. So there's no attraction for the water to this oil. And there's no attraction for the oil to the water. So we really don't get these to mix, so they stay away from each other. Now as I said before, going back to this slide here, uh, not that one, this one. Um, when I said before that we talk, we think of the water as the solvent doing the dissolving of the solid. Well really it's only because they mutually attract each other. That's really the case. So it's not really that the water is doing the attraction. The ion is also doing the attraction. So it's not just one thing that's doing it. It's both of them that are causing the water to dissolve. Okay. Uh, so what we get to is this, this idea that, oops, I think this is the slide that I want. For covalent compounds, we're talking about things that are not ionic. So remember there's ionic and covalent. So if it's a covalent compound, some covalent compounds will dissolve in water while others will not. And it depends on whether they are polar or nonpolar. So you might want to go back to bonding and shapes, which was chapter 12, and review that to determine whether something is polar or nonpolar, because that is what's going to cause it to dissolve. So when you deal with molecules or covalent compounds, it can get a little difficult when you're trying to determine whether they're, they're soluble or not. Now, nonpolar molecules are insoluble while polar ones will be soluble. So that's the key, is the polar ones are soluble, nonpolar ones are not soluble. All right, so that brings us to this slide, which is going to summarize that idea, which tells us that like dissolves like. What this means is that more alike the intermolecular forces are, the higher the solubility. So if the forces holding the molecules together are very similar to the waters, then they will dissolve. And this is in general what we say. We say that nonpolar solvents will dissolve nonpolar solutes, polar will dissolve polar. So we, we need to understand that idea of polarity. So I want to go back and review that for not only this, but also for the final exam. All right. Uh, now we saw electrolytes. Don't forget there are also non-electrolytes, which was what the glucose um, did. It dissolved in water, but it did not produce an electric current. Um, we also have weak electrolytes. So some things that might, they dissolve, but they don't produce as strong of a, a charge as the um, uh, ionic compound will be somewhere in the middle. So don't forget about those terms as well. All right, one last bit, little bit we're going to look at is how we describe solutions. You should be familiar with these terms. Um, saturated and unsaturated, supersaturated, I mean, it's really just a matter of defining the terms. Uh, concentrated and dilute are other terms that we use for this. Uh, saturated just means it has as much as it can possibly hold. Unsaturated means you could add more. And supersaturated means that it has too much. What we tend to use are these charts for that. These are called solubility curves. What this is going to do, solubility refers to how much we can dissolve into a solution. So what these curves are showing us is how temperature affects the solubility. When we increase the temperature, we get an increase in the solubility for most ionic compounds. Not all of them are going to do this, but for most ionic compounds, we see an increase in the solubility. All right, so if we can see the line is the solubility. So what we would do is we say at this temperature, this is what my solubility of potassium chloride is. It's this, so it's going to be about 18 grams of, of uh, salt that I can dissolve into the water. So the solubility tells us how much we can dissolve in. If it's above the line, 
it would be supersaturated, below the line would be unsaturated, on the line is saturated. So these would be all the solubil solubility points. Notice that sodium chloride is not very soluble as temperature goes up, whereas potassium nitrate is very affected by the changes in temperature. So this is for ionic compounds. So this would be for ionic solids that we would dissolve in water. When we look at gases dissolved in water, we see the opposite effect. As temperature goes up, the gases are going to come out. And this is really you know, dangerous for fish because of high temperatures of the water, the oxygen that the fish are breathing is going to come out of the water. So because the particles collide and then the, they stick together and the gas bubbles come out more often. So for gases dissolved in water, we see the opposite effect. Higher temperatures cause um, the gases to come out of solution and therefore make it flat. And you should know this. This is why we put our pop in, uh, in the refrigerator because we want to keep the carbonation in there. Cold temperatures keep the carbonation in. And to summarize that last couple of charts there, if we increase temperature in general, the solubility of solids increases, the solubility of gases decreases. Increasing pressure, um, don't worry about that. We're not, we're not doing that. So skip that one. All right, so that's it, guys. I'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot.